Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Okay. This rulemaking hearing is called to order. It is Monday, September 11th, 2017. This rulemaking hearing is taking place pursuant to TCA 4-5-204 at 500 James Robertson Parkway, Davy Crockett Tower, first floor conference room 1A in Nashville, Tennessee. My name is Lee Ferguson. I serve as Assistant General Counsel for Fire Prevention with the Department of Commerce, and today I'm representing the electrical, residential, and marina section of the Division of Fire Prevention. Those members of the public who wish to speak during the hearing and comment on the proposed rules should, should sign up on the sheets provided at the table at the back entrance. Um, only those who signed up will be permitted to speak. We'll gather that list in a few minutes and I will call the names off of that list. Please print your name so that I can read it. You may step up to this podium. Please state your name and present your question to the panel and they will respond for the record. So if any of you who wish to speak have not already signed up, please make sure that you do so. With the staff members who are present and appearing on behalf of the Division of Fire Prevention to respond to any questions, please introduce themselves for the record. Dwight. My name is Dwight Thornton. I'm the uh, Middle Tennessee Supervisor. Larry Craddock. I'm the East Tennessee Supervisor. Joel Crofton, West Tennessee Supervisor. Mark Boring, Marina Inspector. I'm Gary Farley. I'm the director of the program. The purpose of this rulemaking hearing is to solicit comments on the proposed amendments to Chapter 0780-02-01, Electrical Installations. The proposed amendments were developed by the division based on a review of the existing rules with input from various representatives of local governments, professional groups, the public, the division, the director, and legal counsel. Your comments and input are important to us. They will be summarized and presented to the commissioner for the implementation of the new rules. Please note that copies of the department's notice to amend chapter 0780-02-01 are available on the table in the back as well as redline copies of the rules. The redline copies distinguish the existing rules from the proposed rules changes by underlining and striking through the existing language and underlining in just red line font text indicates new language. The notice of rulemaking hearing includes the entire text of the proposed rules and was filed by the with the Secretary of State on July 14, 2017 and was published on the Administrative Register at the Secretary of State's website. Director Farley, was notice of this hearing provided to any interested parties? Yes, it was, and I'll read the, the list here. Um, the Fire Chief Association was David Windrow, Eddie Phillips, Home Builders Association with the state, Susan Ritter, Jen Lacey, and Don Glaze, Phoenix Society, Burn Victims, Amy Acton, NFPA, Randy Safer, Jeff Sargent, NEMA, Brian Holland, the Tennessee Fire and Safety Inspectors Association, Dan Johnson and Wayne Wagner, Tennessee Building Officials Association, Keith Bruner, Adam Price, David Hodges, an R. Meester with the City of Collierville, Steve Mills, the uh, GovOps committee members, I won't read all those, but it was, it was all them. The International Association of Electrical Inspectors, uh, Susan Scarce. And all of our uh, deputy electrical inspectors it was sent to. It was also sent to Ben Sanders with Farm Bureau, Tracy Harney with uh, USAA, Scott White with State Farm, Aaron Collins with the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. It was also sent to Mandy Young, and she represents American Council of Life Insurance, Property Casualty Insurance Associations of America, Cigna, Unum, Life and Health Guarantee Association. And it was also sent to David Brumel with Baker Donaldson, and they represent American Insurance Association, all state, nationwide, U.S. USAA and PNC Guarantee Association and NCCI. And um, that's all I have right now. TCA Section 68-102-113, 68-102-143, 68-102-602, and 68-102-603 authorize the Commissioner of Commerce and Insurance under the authority of the State Fire Marshal 
to make reasonable rules and regulations to implement the objectives of TCA Title 68, Chapter 102. These duties include adopting regulations consistent with statutory provisions for safeguarding to a reasonable degree of life and property from the hazards of fire and explosion and from conditions hazardous to life or property in the use of buildings, structures, or premises, and providing a program to ensure that electrical inspection services are avail available throughout the state on a timely basis. TCA Section 4-5-204A4 requires the Department to present a summary of the factual information on which the proposal is based. That summary is as follows. The Department is proposing the adoption of the 2017 edition of the Natural, National Electric Code to replace the 2008 edition. Rule 0780-02-01-0.04 inspections is amended to allow Deputy Fire Marshals to perform electrical inspections where the need arises so long as they are properly certified. Furthermore, the amendments provide that the inspection will be required on reconnections of electrical power to a building, temporary service pole, or temporary service releases. Additionally, supplying of electrical power for final inspections will be required in residential and commercial buildings in which the electrical power has been disconnected. These amendments also add the requirement that all signs receiving electrical power should be inspected. Rule 0780-02-01-0.05 is amended to clarify that the permit application fee of $5 is in addition to all other required inspection fees. Another change will delete language related to an electric electrician registration program, which is no longer housed in the Department of Fire Prevention. It is currently handled by the Tennessee Board for Licensing Contractors. Rule 0780-02-01-0.11 the amendments reflect the statutory changes made in Tennessee Public Chapter Number 120 from 2015. The primary changes clarify that the statute is applicable to newly constructed homes and changes the term smoke detector to smoke alarm, which is more commonly used in the industry. Additionally, installations of smoke alarms must be in accordance with the building standards adopted by the State Fire Marshal pursuant to 10 code annotated uh, TCA Section 68-102-101 rather than the 2003 International Residential Code. The most substantive statutory change to the smoke alarm section is the removal of the previous exemption for a one-family dwelling unit built and occupied by a family from smoke alarm requirements. Also related to dwelling units, the uh, proposed rules require guarded covers for light fixtures for, in crawl spaces. The amendments to this section increase the maximum number of outlets allowed on a 15 amperage circuit from 10 to 13 and increases the maximum number allowed on a 20 amp circuit from 12 to 15 outlets. Smoke alarm outlets will be exempt from that count. Rule 0780-02-01-.22, the amendment clarifies that the appropriate section of the National Electric Code will be used when the time of installation of a marina cannot be determined. The proposed rules also reduce the allowed ground fault protection for main overcurrent protective devices from 100 milliamp to 30 milliamp. Additionally, the rules add language permitting voltage in the yard or peer distribution systems to exceed the maximum voltage specified in the NEC if written documentation is submitted from a licensed engineer. Several other amendments are to be considered are minor by adding minimal language in order to provide greater clarity and to the make, make the rules more uniform with the language of the electrical standards and codes adopted and applied across the state. These amendments include those considered as housekeeping in general, which include correcting citations as required in rulemaking guidelines adopted by the Secretary of State, correcting grammatical errors, and renumbering statute citations accordingly. TCA Section 5-4-403 requires the department to prepare a regulatory flexibility analysis and economic impact statement regarding whether the proposed rules are deemed to affect small business. The economic impact statement is filed with the Secretary of State as an addendum to the adopted rules. There are six questions which I will read into the record now. What are the types and estimated number of small businesses directly affected? Small businesses involved in electrical installations as well as the building and construction industry will be affected by the promulgation of these rules. Additionally, all small businesses will need to ensure that electrical installations do comply with the minimum electrical standards. 
the projected report, uh, reporting, record keeping, and other administrative cost as a result of these rules. There is no foreseeable alteration in the existing reporting or record keeping utilized by small businesses that will result from the promulgation of these rules. Probable effect on the small business. Small businesses involved in the electrical installations as well as the building and construction industry will be affected by the promulgation of these rules. Is there a less burdensome, intrusive, or costly alternative method? The amended rules are not, in, not anticipated to impact small businesses more than the current rules provide. There's not been a less burdensome or intrusive or costly alternative method identified or recommended for use. What is the comparison with federal or state counterparts? There's no federal counterpart to these rules. The effect of possible exemption on small business. There are no possible exemptions for small businesses to the requirement contained in these rules. TCA section 4-5-220 and 4-5-228 require any proposed rules to be promulgated shall state in a simple and declarative sentence without additional comments on the merits of the policy of the rule or regulation whether the rule or regulation may have a projected impact on local government. The amended rules will likely impact local governments which operate electrical inspection programs in their respective jurisdiction. A final reminder to folks who joined us later, there's a sign-up sheet in the back of the room. For folks who want to make a public comment, you, need to, you must sign up on the sheet in the back of the room before you will be allowed to make a comment. So if anyone has joined the hearing and did not sign up on the sheet and wants to make a comment, please do that right now. As we hear public comments on the proposed rules, I as moderator reserve the right to limit such comments if they become repetitive and for the purpose of time. Please limit your comments accordingly to no more than three to five minutes per person. As mentioned earlier, we do want to hear from everyone who has signed the sheet and want to provide an opportunity for them to speak. However, there are a few people here present today, so we want to be mindful of everyone's time. Select the sign in sheet now. When I receive the sheet, we'll just start at the beginning and, and go down the list. When you approach the podium, please identify yourself for the record. We have a court reporter here who's transcribing, so please speak uh, loudly and clearly. Um, spell your name if it is an uncommon spelling. Is there anything else you will need? comments received today will be a part of the official record. After we've received your comment or question um, and it's appropriate, the panel will respond. Um, you're not necessarily limited to one question. You can ask follow-up questions, but we, we're not going to engage in debate here today. First, Mr. Waters. Can everyone hear me okay? So uh, good morning. My name is Keith Waters. I'm here to represent the approximately 1,500 Snyder Electric employees that live and work across the state of Tennessee, as well as the over 220 businesses and their employees that we support. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak, especially on the safety for they and their families. One of the things that I wanted to bring up is there are many differences between the 2017 National Electric Code and the 2008 existing National Electric Code we currently follow. I wanted to de detail a few of the differences for the committee and, and for the room. One, reduced electrocutions by expansion of ground fault circuit interrupters used in homes. Reduced fire hazards by arc fault circuit interrupter expansion to protect wiring. Reduced electrocutions by increased ground fault protection requirements for marinas and boat docks. Improved worker safety by the addition of electrical arc reduction safety requirements for commercial and industrial facilities. 
safe installation of PV solar electrical systems that are not owned by utilities. This particular one was something that we had to deal with at our Smyrna, Tennessee location when we built a PV system several years ago. There was, there was not any existing installation guideline from, for uh, installations in Tennessee. Safe installations of energy storage systems, as we all hear in the news, the growth in this particular field. An increased reliability of emergency and fire protection systems, as well as safety circuits for industrial machines used by increased surge protection. You're going to hear probably a lot today on AFCI expansion. The reason I mention these other items is we tend, I've seen a growth or a, a focus on these aspects of the code. There are some things that I would like to mention that you look at uh, in that regard. So as we move to the uh, 2017, it is more about than one section of the code. But there is a uh, report I would suggest you uh, take a look at and even find the YouTube videos. UL did a, uh, a study for the National Fire Protection Association around fire flashover. It's focused on the current home furnishings within the home. And what, it, what they found was that in today's home, you have about five minutes before that flashover occurs. And previously, in the not too distant past, it was 30 minutes. So one of the things as we look at AFCIs and other increased safety uh, opportunities here, those ability for our families to get out of the homes faster is fine. But if you can prevent the ignition source from occurring before they have to try to beat that five minute flashover, then, uh, then that's a good thing. So what I would ask is uh, for you to support movement from the 2008 to the 2017 National Electric Code without amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waters. Uh, Mr. Charlie Monks. Monks. Hi, my name's uh, Charlie Monks, and I'm with Eaton Corporation right here in Nashville, Tennessee. I could go into all the details about how we have 650 employees and multiple plants and everything here, but that's really not important today. I think uh, what's most important to me is the passion for protecting property and lives. I can speak through experience. Um, my first house that we built uh, burnt, and nothing more heart-wrenching than pulling in and finding your house on fire. Uh, that's one that could have possibly been prevented, maybe not. Uh, I was also a volunteer fireman uh, for many years in the past, not currently, but in the past. I'm 60 years old now, so really not into climbing ladders and jumping off roofs. But anyways, uh, nothing worse than pulling into a fire uh, whenever the lady of the house and the kid and the dog standing out there in the yard and crying and they might be looking for the cat, you know, and like I said, as a volunteer fireman uh, in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania, and also right here in Arrington, Tennessee. I, I live in Franklin, so I've been, been around for a while. I've been with Eaton for about 28 years, and, and like I say, I've experienced both of those. So if there's a fire we can prevent, I think it's, it's all worth it. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, I'm also a electrician. I haven't practiced electrician since I joined Eaton 28 years ago, but I am a licensed electrician through IBW Local 712 in Beaver, Pennsylvania, and card carry member, and went through a five-year apprenticeship program there. So when we're talking about wiring breakers, I think I would know how to wire a breaker. I've heard so many rumors and stories and how things have grown, and arc fault breakers are going to add $10,000 to the cost of your home. Well, I can tell you as of being a manufacturer and being a senior sales engineer with Eaton Corporation, roughly the difference of a single pull breaker is about $25 per pull. So in your average home, three bedroom, two bathroom home, if you got 20 breakers that are single pull times $25, that comes out to about $500. It's probably less money than what you spent uh, on the bathtub. So uh, to me, $500 is a well worth investment in protecting your property and your family. Uh, the other thing that I hear a lot is, is they're so hard to install. Well, I'll have to differ with that uh, today. Eaton and, and our other manufacturers have come out what's called a plug-on neutral. Basically what it is is the breaker, it plugs onto the bus, 
for power, and it also has a stab that plugs onto the neutral. So all you're doing is you're laying in the white wire, which is your neutral, to the breaker instead of to the neutral bar. It's not any more labor intensive. Uh, we also have quick connect neutrals, which would have a short tail, which go from the breaker to the neutral bar. There you are tightening one more screw. So like I say, and as far as troubleshooting, I've heard you know, we come across the same thing when people come out with ground fault breakers. And it was like, oh man, I don't know. They're just so tough to troubleshoot. Well, now with our breakers, our arc fault breakers, we have diagnostic codes available. Uh, they're not in all of them, but we do have them available. Similar to your furnace, whenever your furnace trips out, the furnace guy goes up and he looks, blinks three times fast, two times slow, it means one thing. Well, our trip codes are down to five things. You either have a broken conductor, you have a short, you have a neutral touch in the ground, you have a series arc, you have a parallel arc. So like I say, it's, it's pretty much self-explanatory. As long as you can read that little paper that comes with that breaker and uh, glad to su supply anybody with that list. Uh, they're, they're very easy to troubleshoot. So like I say, it's just, uh, it's my passion uh, to save lives and save property. I'm just old country boy that lives here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Scott White. I'm Scott White. I represent State Farm Insurance Company. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to provide comment today. State Farm is the largest insurer of homes in Tennessee, and we wholeheartedly support the department's efforts in adopting the 2017 NEC. Tennessee is approximately sixth in the nation for civilian structured fire fatalities, and that's about twice the national average. Um, State Farm has great concern over this and feels that the adoption of modern electrical code will help save lives and protect property. As you're aware, Tennessee is currently operating under a code that uh, was written in 2008. So we're 10 years behind uh, the curve here and I believe two or three cycles behind um, other NEC adoptions. Um, these are minimum standards um, and they are uh, well vetted and well thought out standards um, that have had input uh, from many interests throughout the nation. And so we support the adoption of these codes in their entirety without any sort of amendment whatsoever. Thank you. Uh, Ronald Bethea. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm Ron Bethea. I'm the Chief Electrical Inspector for Memphis and Shelby County Code Enforcement. Uh, Memphis and Shelby County supports the efforts of the Tennessee State Fire Marshal's Office to repeal the amendment limiting the requirement of arc fault circuit interrupters to dwelling unit bedrooms. We feel that the full implementation of this technology will be beneficial to the safety of the citizens of Tennessee. The electrical and electronics industries of today are technologically, technologically driven. Uh, innovations in the marketplace have resulted in more and more electronic and electrical appliances being brought into the home environment. Uh, to meet the increased demand, residential electrical systems are becoming more complex as well. As the complexity of these systems grows, the pool of skilled labor necessary for their proper installation continues to decline. It has never been more important to leverage the latest technological advancements to protect residential wiring systems. By shutting off the circuit upon detection of both series of parallel arcing faults, Arc fault circuit interrupters provide an additional level of fire protection that cannot be achieved with standard molded case type circuit breakers. These, arc, these arcing faults are often the source of ignition of fires in one and two family dwelling units. And these arcing faults can be caused by damage to the branch circuit conductor insulation from staples being driven too tight, severed conductors from cables being uh, penetrated by screws or nails, or loose connections on receptacles or switch terminals, or pinched or bound appliance cords. Uh, we also would like to recommend that the amendment limiting the number of outlets on a circuit be eliminated, and this would lessen the cost of the full implementation of arc fault circuit interrupters. It's, uh, that would permit the uh, calculation of branch circuit loads for general illumination to be based on square footage as permitted by Section 220.12 of the 2017 NEC. I think the 
I think that rule was necessary, if I understand correctly, because of uh, restricting or limiting the application of art fault to dwelling unit bedrooms provided motivation for the electrical contractors to try to put all the bedroom outlets on one circuit and thus limit the number of art fault circuit breakers that would be necessary to complete an installation. Uh, if we have full implementation of the AFCI technology, then there would be no motivation for the contractors to do that anymore because all the circuits would be AFCI protected. There would be no benefit to trying to uh, extend those circuits more than what would be permitted by the NEC. That's, that's all I have to say. Thank you for your comment. Mr. Keith Stager. to support full invitation of the 2017 National Electric Code. Conferences of the National Fire Protection Association, I've seen firsthand how all parties to the um, construction industry are very well represented uh, at NFPA and the concerns of all parties are, are very thoroughly heard uh, before any National Electric Code. Um, it, goes through the multiple review, multi-year multi review process and, and is it adopted by the full, final vote of the uh, NFPA. So I would uh, simply like Mr. Dennis Epperson. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Dennis Epperson uh, from Cleveland, Tennessee, a builder, uh, and also HBAT, uh, Home Builders Association of Tennessee's president, 2017. Uh, we are, uh, our problem with the 2017 is just one issue, and it's the arc fault. Um, we we kind of look at this kind of like we did the fire sprinkle. Uh, we don't see it that it's justified. Um, we don't, the an arc fault breaker cannot uh, 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 stop a arc from happening. All it can do is mitigate it. Um, the cost that we're seeing, we're looking at anywhere from 1000 to $2,000 per house, depending on what kind of, uh, you know, 200 amp service, 400 amp service. Um, we just don't see that it's justifiable to put that kind of increase on our homes that we're building today. Um, we, we've seen issues with those arc fault protectors being in those bedrooms. We have numerous callbacks all the time. Um, and also, in, if you look at the facts, 85% of all fires have, have in homes that are 20 years and older. Uh, since 1999, um, the, the way we do, the way we wire our homes today, I mean, the, the facts are the facts. I mean, you're looking at most of the fires happening in homes that are 20 years old. So we we are for the 2017, all except for the arc fault provision. We would like to see that removed and uh, exempt from from that. So appreciate your time and uh, letting us speak, and uh, hope y'all would consider that. Charlotte Peak. Good morning. My name is Charlotte Peak, and I'm a home builder from Cleveland, Tennessee. I'm speaking on behalf of the Home Builders Association of Tennessee. Thank you for allowing my testimony. Simply put, an AFCI device is intended to provide protection from the effects of an arc by recognizing characteristics unique to arcing and de-energizing the circuit when an arc fault is detected. AFCIs are meant to protect against a sustained arc at a loose connection or between conductors that have damaged insulation. Unwanted arcs can sometimes reach conditions that will ignite adjacent combustor, combustible material. However, although AFCI can mitigate the arc's potential effects, it cannot prevent them. And while an AFCI device can detect some ground faults, they do not protect against as many as a ground fault circuit interrupter. At the time when AFCs AFCIs, can I just say ARC so we know what we're talking about? At the time when ARC faults were first introduced by the 1999 edition of the National Electrical Code, 
Approval was largely ba based on several U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission reports. However, the number of incidents cited at the time were several times higher than in later reports, and where the data showed that ARC faults would have a minimal benefit, the results were ignored. This left the resulting benefits way overblown. The 1998 NFPA report only referred to residential fires but did not define which specific types of res residences were included. The 2012 report clarified that the data included not only single family and multifamily dwellings, but also mobile home and motor homes while used as a structure and not in transit. The electrical problems AFCIs are designed to prevent occur overwhelmingly in older dwellings. In a CPSC study, residential electrical distribution system fires showed that 85% of fires of electrical origin occur in homes that are more than 20 years old, as Dennis had cited earlier. Since 1999, countless changes have been made in both the National Electrical Code and product safety standards, which mitigate against similar fires in newer homes, even as they age. The strongest association with electrical distribution fires were observed in dwellings over 40 years old with more than half of the housing stock older than 35 years. Electrical issues have become an increasing larger player in residential fires. From the, this is from the U.S. Fire Administration 2016. Most older homes were wired with a very limited number of receptacles necessitating extensive use of extension cords or improper alterations and additions to original electrical system, both of which are fire hazards. Grounding provisions in NEC have expanded to require electrical enclosures and boxes to be grounded and equipment grounding conductor in the wiring. These grounding methods increase the likelihood of low-level arcing faults progressing rapidly to arcing ground faults of a magnitude sufficient to activate conventional circuit breakers. As non-metallic sheathed cable, Romex, with its dedicated grounding wire has become the norm, the likelihood of arcing faults of the hot to ground type detectable by conventional circuit breaker increased significant, significantly. Conversely, there has been an equally significant decrease in the probability of arc faults occurring that an arc fault de device can detect. If the argument is that all new dwellings eventually get old, thereby making arc faults necessary, the improvements in the NEC remain in the home as it ages. You might wonder what if you plug in grandma's antique lamp or flea market finding your new home without an arc fault protection? Although this is hypothetical from a technical perspective, it is important to note that AFCIs do not detect all types of arcs such as a series arc. As the Siemens fact on AFCI states, arc faults will identify Symptoms of a glowing contact by detecting a parallel arc. However, nearby materials may be ignited before the trip occurs. Frankly, any type of antique appliance must be rewired to today's safety standards prior to use. We respectfully request that the 2017 NEC be amended to require the installation of arc fault circuit interrupters in bedrooms only, leaving all other rooms optional. And just to recap, NFPA on their website, the top reasons for house fires, number one, are grease fires in kitchens. So let's take out all, all the frying pans of the kitchens and stop fires in the kitchens. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Susan Ritter. Good morning. My name is Susan Ritter, and I'm the Executive Vice President for the Home Builders Association of Tennessee, and I thank you for allowing us to be represented today. Our association represents 2,500 members across Tennessee, all in the involved in the business of residential and light commercial construction. I would like to submit for the record our letter of request, written position document, and support materials from the National Association of Home Builders, of which we're a part, on the adoption of the 27 NEC. Who shall I give these materials to? I'll get them before we leave. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It has to be said, the reliability of arc fault protectors are, protectors are bleak. Nuisance callbacks for poorly performing products are numerous and expensive. A homeowner with a TV on and running a vacuum cleaner or blow dryer have been known to trip an AFCI, ultimate resulting in an irate homeowner 
calling their builder or their electrician to correct the issue. The majority of instances, the product itself is not broken or installed incorrectly. It is performance related. When a refrigerator or a freezer trips, the AFCI, while, while the homeowner is not at home, all of its contents are ruined. That is not an if. It happens to brand new appliances and correctly installed arc faults and wiring. Due to concerns about the performance of arc faults, South Dakota exempts life support equipment from arc fault protection. Whether arc fault requirements in the NEC that apply to new construction will have a meaningful impact in reducing the number of dwelling fires of electrical origin as they age is speculative. We believe meeting current NEC requirements along with new product safety manufacturing, new homes are safe without the additional expense of installing arc fault protection. It is estimate, estimated that the installed cost for meeting the arc fault mandate as required in the 2017 NEC to be anywhere from $1,000 to $3,000 in a new home as quoted by licensed electricians. In Tennessee, for every $1,000 increase in the final price of a home, 4,296 homeowners will no longer qualify for a mortgage. And that calculation is based on the National Association of Home Builders um, math as well as Habitat for Humanity. In the case of Habitat or THDA, price sensitivity is that much more concerning. We recommend the adoption of the 2017 National Electric Code, but we urge amending the arc fault requirements to just bedrooms, leaving the installation in all other rooms optional. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Don Glaze. Good morning. My name is Don Glaze. I'm executive director of the West Tennessee Home Builders Association, and I'm here today to speak on behalf of that organization. With me from Memphis today, by the way, are two of my home builder members and past presidents, Mac Andrews and Steve Hodgkins. The position we are here to talk about today was developed in conjunction with several of our builder members and with the electrical contractor members of our association and with the departments of uh, code inspection from Memphis Shelby County, City of Bartlett, and City of Collierville. <clears throat> Simply put, we are here today to ask that the recommended amendment limiting the maximum number of outlets on a 15 amp circuit to 13 and the maximum number of outlets on a 20 amp circuit be limited to 15. We want that recommendation withdrawn and we would like to have that amendment repealed from the current code. This will likely reduce um, the number of general, general illumination circuits uh, required for most dwelling units and reduce the number of circuit breakers needed to comply with the NEC. Uh, we would prefer that the NEC provision for allowing the calculation of branch circuit loads for general illumination be based on square footage as permitted by section 220.12 of the 2017 NEC. The rationale for this request is that the power draw in a typical house has been going down over the past few years due to more efficient appliances and lighting. For example, modern energy smart electronics and electrical appliances are far more energy efficient today when compared to even just a few years ago. While there may be more electrical and electronic appliances in use today, the truth is that they're used less often at the same time. So a kitchen counter with a convenience center may have a dozen uh, electrical appliances on the counter, but the reality is they're only being used um, at one or two at a time, not all together. On the illumination side, the mandatory use of CFL lamps and increased use of LED lighting also results in less power draw. So therefore, I think it just makes sense that we go back to the NEC calculation of how many branch circuits can be on, on one line. So uh, we respectfully submit that and um, appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. David Windrow.
Good morning. Uh, my name is David Windrow. I'm the Deputy Chief of Operations for Brentwood Fire Rescue. I'm here on behalf of the more than 500 members of the Tennessee Fire Chiefs Association. We support adopting the 2017 code as proposed without gutting out any of the safety requirements. Uh, we hate to see exceptions and exceptions on top of exceptions. For one, it makes it harder for the inspectors because they got to look all over for those exceptions. And it just deteriorates the safety measure that's built in with a consensus standard. And these consensus standards are minimums. They're not maximums to begin with. So to take out a minimum is detrimental to the safety. And our only concern is representing the safety of Tennesseans in particular, and then secondary, our members that have to go into these homes. Uh, I keep hearing the term either 40 years or 20 year old homes. Well, I can promise you in Spring Hill, Franklin, or Brentwood, we wouldn't have any fires if there were if it were 20 year old homes. We have lots of fires. Some of them are six months old, some of them are a month old, some of them are 10 years old, and some are 30 or 40 years old. But every age home burns, and I was never a strong math major, but at some point these houses will be 20 years old. So that it's not, you know, why not build the safety measure in to begin with? Some things were said at the Joint Ops Government Committee back in June that just were very, just didn't cover all the facts. Uh, and I would like to share from the serenity prayer, there are things I cannot change, and then I need the courage to change things I can. And they argue that the number one cause of fires is cooking. Well, I can't be in, every, we can't be in everyone's house at night. The second leading cause listed is smoking. Well, I can't stop people from smoking, but I can control the building aspect before someone ever moves in. I have the ability to fix some electrical problems before they come in. And the actual number one cause for certainly in Tennessee fires is undetermined. Well, my 33 years of experience, it takes three things to have a fire. Fuel, whatever's in that room, heat, and oxygen. Well, normally, to be kind to the electrical industry, most rooms have electricity that provide a heat source. We just don't pin it on that because it would take an, an enormous amount of resources of the citizens' taxpayer money to determine what was the pinpoint cause. Normally, we eliminate that it's not malicious or intentional, and then it's just not cost effective to dig into the rubble and determine what was the pinpoint accuracy, but if we did that, Unfortunately, electrical would probably be the number one cause of fires in America, but we just don't have the time or money, and it really would not have benefit anything. It was, again, it wasn't not an intentionally set fire, so the insurance company would pay either way. But what I can have the courage to change, and what the fire chief's position is, don't take any safety measure out of the code, because we can control that. I can control that element before someone ever moves in. Uh, possibility that 10 lives in Memphis, that's a, a litmus test for this case uh, <laughs> lost their lives last year. Uh, again, not all because of a malfunctioning air condition unit. So we just say don't take things out of the code and, let, and adopt it as is. And again, these houses will be 20 years old 20 years from now. Thanks. Mr. Randy Safer. Good morning. My name is Randy Safer. I'm the Southern Regional Director for the National Fire Protection Association. I want to thank you all for have, giving us all the opportunity to come, come uh, here and make our comments. And I want to thank the Tennessee State Fire Marshal's Office and the Department of Commerce and Insurance for doing the right thing and then proposing to adopt 2017 edition of the National Electrical Code with no amendments. You know, you hear all these comments, you hear all this data and all these facts, and yep, cooking is the number one cause of fires, as it was stated, but it's not the number one cause of fire deaths. Fire deaths occur, most fire deaths occur, and in the middle of the night when people are asleep, and many of them occur because of electrical malfunctions. And they don't occur, like I said, cooking is not the number one cause of fire deaths, but it is the number one cause of fires. Uh, you know, uh, my son and his fiance are going to be married in a few months. They're looking at houses to buy. And they're looking at new houses to buy. And they had no idea that a brand new home in Tennessee was being built with electrical requirements that are almost 10 years old. You know, and homeowners, when they go, 
to look at a new house, they think that the homes that they're about to buy and move their family in are built to the latest safety electrical standards that are available in the United States. And many parts of the country, the 2017 edition with no amendments is available to new homeowners. In Tennessee, it's not, unless a homeowner decides to take it upon himself to do, to do it and go to the extra time and a small expense to do that. You know, and uh, like I said, most homeowners believe that, that the homes are built to the latest standards and the latest codes. The National Electrical Code, NFPA, been writing electrical code since the late 1800s. And with technology, and the gentleman from, um, I think it was Snyder Electric, talked about the, the study that Underwriters Laboratories did showing a home from the 70s with the similar um, furnishings and a newer home with the furnishings and how fast the flashover would occur. In addition to that, I mean, a lot of that has to do with the way the homes are today. The homes are beautiful today. I mean, our home builders do a beautiful job in the layout and the design and the construction of the homes that we see across our state and across the nation. But there are some things, new homes do burn. The facts are new homes do burn and we have the data to prove it. And new homes burn faster. New homes collapse faster than homes that were built 40 years ago as well because of the spans are longer and the building material is different. And with the open floor plans, it gives more fuel and more oxygen and, and a faster spread of flames and smoke, which is not only a danger to the occupants in the home, but it's also a, a big danger to the firefighters responding to those scenes. And we've had firefighters die across the nation in, in new homes due to collapse. We had one in South Tennessee just a few years ago who died in a new home fire because of a collapse in a floor. Uh, again, I thank you all for doing the right thing, proposing the adoption of the 2017 edition of the NEC. And as always, NFPA will be here to provide all of the state electrical inspectors with any updated training no, at no cost and all new books at no cost. And you know our advisory service, we ask any code questions where there may be some questions to where you know, there's confusion on what's allowed and what's not allowed. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have any other questions and I can provide any of the data that's been um, mentioned here today. We have, a, we have the largest fire service library in the world available and we have a ton of information. As you know, Gary, I will uh, pr uh, provide any information you need. Thanks again. Have you having a, we thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, John Ferris. Don Outlaw Jr. No comment. Okay. Mr. Pancake Cow. Is that right? Sorry. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pankaj Lal. I'm a resident of Nashville, Tennessee, and I also work for Schneider Electric. Uh, I would like to state a couple of points, uh, some of which may have been mentioned earlier, but it's, I think, important to reinforce. Number one, I support the adoption of the 2017 NEC without amendments. What I want to spend a little time focusing on is talking about uh, arc fault protection in the home, since I know that's a topic of discussion today. And I want to clarify a couple of things. Uh, number one, uh, arc fault is a technology that can help stop a fire before it starts. Okay. Uh, think about smoke detectors. Uh, how they used today and how pervasive their homes are highly beneficial to homeowners but think about what they do when there is a smoke in the home at that point they trigger a noise or an alarm or a beep arc fault is different it can help prevent a fire before it occurs and the thing with arc fault when you think of the causes for it it's many times hidden behind a wall that you and i as a homeowner cannot see i have two young daughters and i don't want them to be in a home and find out that I am traveling and something happens to the home. I mean, there's an, you know, something that is personal to me. It's not just because of our technology, not just because I'm Schneider Electric. I'm speaking as a concerned citizen. Uh, we heard a couple of points around cost. Uh, you know, uh, we talk about arc fault and the varying numbers. I can tell you, you know, from all the manufacturers out there, uh, cost of arc fault technology implemented in a typical single family home 
is 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 to 0 0.25 percent, and the numbers may vary slightly depending on a home size, square footage, amperage, number of circuits out there. It's a very insignificant cost uh, to your home. When you think about, you know, what does that mean if your own children are, are in harm's way? Would you want to not provide the best and safest technology that is currently available today? Try talking to the families uh, who have lost dear and loved ones. Talk to the families who lost seven children in Memphis last year when they lost their dear children and it was because of an electrical fire. You can read all the NFPS statistics that are in the public domain and they're leading causes of fire and as one of the esteemed gentlemen just stated earlier, 48% of those electrical fires, you know, are, don't have an exact cause, but they very, you know, if you did a study, you would find them that they relate back to, you know, or tie back to arc fault. Uh, there are a lot of reports related to structure fires that are available, uh, and I'll be happy to submit those for consideration to the team also. I heard some comments about troubleshooting. Uh, it's, you know, it's hard to troubleshoot. I can tell you not just Schneider, but all the breaker manufacturers have troubleshooting technology that is available in the product that you can, as a contractor or as a homeowner or as an individual, very easily find out what the cause is. I heard about nuisance tripping. Uh, Let's state there is nuisance stripping, but that's the, the incidence of it is very, 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 very small. That should not be a reason for you to stop adoption of our fault technology. Let me give you a real example of why. So I have a smoke detector. I was living in uh, Williamson County, and my smoke detector in the garage decided to turn on at 3 a.m. in the morning. I checked out. There was no fire. The wiring looked okay. What I discovered was the battery needed to be replaced. So I put up my 11 and 12-foot ladder and climb up. Yes, it was inconvenient, but should that be the reason because it creates a nuisance for you to stop adoption of a technology? I don't think so. But also about fire statistics, is it in new homes, old homes? Fire doesn't know age. It can happen anywhere and everywhere. Okay? And when you look at what can cause a fire, again, it's because of arc fault. It's a series arc fault or parallel arc fault. Depending on how the installation was done in the home, depending on whether you had a nail uh, which you, you know, kind of hit in the drywall and that nail pierced a wire, depending on how deep it went, that fire can occur in days, weeks, months, or years. Do you want to take, take that chance? It's like talking about airbag safety. You know, I want to remove, uh, you know, airbags uh, because of all the issues right now today that are occur occurring with some manufacturers. That's not a reason to mitigate or minimize safety. Again, ArcFault is a proven technology. It's been uh, supported by UL, CPSC, and it's been out there for over 20 years. It's a proven technology. Most states in America do adopt the latest code, whether it's 2014 or now 2017. And I would highly urge uh, Tennessee to adopt the latest 2017 code. Thank you. Mr. Andrew Perry. Good morning. My name is Andrew Pieri. I'm the Director of Development Services for the City of Portland, Tennessee. Uh, my comments will just be very, very brief about some of the things that um, uh, I've noticed in the uh, proposed rules. Um, I'd like uh, clarification in the rules uh, under requirements for who's authorized to conduct electrical inspections. Um, there's mention to deputy fire marshals as part of the proposed rules. I'd like to see that um, maybe reclassified or changed to say deputy fire marshals uh, that meet the requirements of state uh, certified electrical inspector. So as I read it right now, it's a very vague uh, notation and it doesn't specifically say that if you're a deputy fire marshal, you can do an electrical inspection if you are not certified as an electrical inspector. So I guess that would be my first uh, concern. Uh, the second uh, concern that I had on proposed rules um, is regards to um, the issuing agents may charge a fee of no more than $5 for issuing an electrical permit. Uh, we took a critical look at our staff level and spoke with some other jurisdictions and the time to process an electrical permit between the initial uh, inspect or authorizing the permit entry in the computer system, processing it through our clerk's office, and again, the the paperwork on the back end to be able to provide that information uh, in our reports to the state of Tennessee, uh, we found that, that $5 is not a, a sufficient amount of money uh, for the work that we're doing in the 
process of issuing a permit, we'd like to see that amount change to $10 to more adequately cover the time that we invest uh, in issuing a permit for the state of Tennessee. Thank you. Andrew Lee. Good morning. My name is Andy Lee. I live at 1242 Carl Seifert Memorial Drive, Brentwood, Tennessee. I moved to Nashville 25 years ago when most outsiders thought Tennessee was stuck in the 60s and my East Coast friends questioned my decision. Nashville has come a long way in the last 25 years to be known as the It City. With that branding, wouldn't you think newcomers to the city and state should have a reasonable expectation that their new home would be built with the latest safety technology? I spoke at the first public hearing on this issue uh, September 27, 2016. I was also present this summer when three paid lobbyists spoke against bringing electrical codes up to 2014 standards, making unsubstantiated claims that this relatively minor expense would make home ownership unattainable for many Tennessee residents. Most of us in this room are smart enough to understand it isn't the $40 difference in the cost of a few extra arc fault circuit interrupters they're driving up the cost of a new home. And when the special interests talk about costs, I want to know if they've even considered what the cost is of losing a loved one in an electrical fire. What about the ongoing hospitalizations and surgeries with those burn injuries that they must endure for the rest of their lives following those fires? And what about the human toll on families, parents, siblings, and friends. Today, I'm here as a burn survivor and volunteer with a peer support program at Vanderbilt's Hospital Burn Center, the Phoenix Society SOAR program. I personally know the pain and sorrow of losing loved ones in an 82-day hospitalization because of a fire that could have been prevented by today's technology. Over my past 10 years as a volunteer with Phoenix Society and Vanderbilt Hospital, I've had several opportunities to console others who have been burned in all kinds of house fires, including electrical fires. I would say to you that any fire involving an injury or death is tragic, and we would not wish that upon anyone. At both of the previous public hearings on this topic, we have heard from fire professionals from across the state and our Tennessee commissioners. They can more eloquently speak to the data and statistics than I can and some of them have already. I'm here today personally to support expanding our electrical code to the 2017 electrical code level and the AFCI requirements that go along with that. With the current building boom going on as others relocate to Tennessee, they are trusting our legislators to ensure our home building standards are at least as high as where they are coming from. Electrical fires in Tennessee are now listed among the top three causes of fire fatalities in Tennessee. We need to stop this from happening. Bringing our electrical codes up to the latest national electrical code requirement levels will do that. Requiring AFCI dev devices in all new home building along with other fire safety devices will do that. If proven technologies exist to stop these fires from starting, then they need to be required not listed as optional or an exception. Now is the time to implement the full 2017 NEC as the electrical building code for all of Tennessee. As grandparents, parents, siblings, I know all of you valued your loved ones. Why would you gamble their lives or risk severe injury in electrical fires that don't have to happen? What you decide today really does matter well beyond this room and for years to come. Delaying or preventing passage won't help. We need your approval so we can protect the people of Tennessee from electrical fires in new homes. Please think about the many lives you will impact with this decision. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Randy Dollar. My name is Randy Dollar with Siemens, and uh, 
You know, I, I hear a lot of anecdotal stories about nuisance trip issues with AFCIs, and it uh, seems like most of the time you hear them around meetings just like this one when we're actually talking about code reviews. Um, at Siemens, we actually log every call that comes in and allocate it to the product category it belongs to. And so I've got statistics from the state of Tennessee. In the last 12 months, we have gotten four phone calls uh, on AFCIs. Of those four phone calls, one has been a nuisance trip report. Uh, our logs say that it was resolved, but I can't see how that it was resolved. Two were wiring issues. There was actually an incorrect wiring in the house, and the AFCI tripping actually caught that, and the contractor corrected it. And the fourth one was a noise issue because the AFCI was emanating a noise. There were two components inside our breaker that oscillated at 60 hertz. And they were damped, and it didn't create a safety issue, but it was a noise issue that we replaced the unit. So uh, for all the, the issues, and maybe there are more, but if we don't get them reported to us, we really don't know anything about them. But according to our records, four issues in the last 12 months. Uh, to address the cost issue, you know, if, if any of you guys are really concerned about the cost, I encourage you just to go look. You can find everything you really need to find online. Uh, if you go to national home improvement uh, websites, uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, whoever you want to go to, uh, look at a standard breaker and look at a, uh, an AFCI. Uh, look at the national average home size, or if you want to, look at the average Tennessee home size. You can find both pieces of information online. You can find uh, current mortgage rates online. Uh, the NEC calls out a minimum number of circuits that you can calculate. And I did math based on using two times the minimum number of circuits in a home. And if you do that and calculate the mortgage rates, you get less than $1 a month impact to the homeowner. So uh, I, I don't really see where AFCI creates that financial problem. Uh, the other financial impact, and I think probably the uh, gentleman that spoke earlier from the insurance company could probably address this better than I could, but there is a uh, building code effectiveness grading schedule rating that is given to each state and each municipal city that impacts homeowners' insurance rates. One of the things that you're doing today can actually help your uh, citizens going forward. Uh, one of the pieces of that is, does your community adopt and enforce the latest edition of nationally recognized codes? Uh, and it is commendable that you're doing that, and in doing so, as in, in the future, you can actually help the insurance rates go down for your homeowners or prevent them from going up, whichever the case may be. Another aspect of that, however, is are the codes amended to weaken the requirements of the nationally recognized code? And uh, if you amend AFCI uh, or, or GFCI or any other function of the code, if you reduce that, that will go as a negative on this BCEGS uh, scoring system. And uh, it, that will have a very long-term effect on the citizens of Tennessee. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. I can't read this next person's last name, but his first name is Chris from Eaton. Clarify for the record. Chris Finnan, F-I-N-E-N. Uh, yes, I work for uh, Eaton Corporation. I'm also a resident of Davidson County here and a licensed uh, professional engineer in the state of Tennessee. I'd just like to speak in favor of the adoption of the NEC 2017 uh, with, without amendment uh, because of all the safety, electrical safety improvements uh, and advances that, that are present in that entire document. Um, specific to the AFCI, I just want to add a couple things. Uh, I think most uh, issues have been um, addressed already. Um, these are not new devices. It is not new technology. Uh, we're into our third decade with this technology of AFCIs. They've been around over 20 years, and the, the uh, nuisance tripping has been almost eliminated entirely. Um, so, you know, let's not do away with the incredible protection and, and fire protection that these devices because of very, very minimal uh, nuisance stripping uh, that gets reported. Um, I also want to make sure that, that we don't ignore the opinion of the, uh, the, the fire experts of this nation that include like the Consumer Product Safety Commission, Underwriters Laboratory, United States Fi uh, Fire Administration, the Electrical Safety Foundation International. 
uh, National Association of State Fire, Fire Marshals and others that in, endorse this. So uh, again, we'd like to uh, speak in favor of the, the uh, amendment to adopt without amendment the uh, National Electric Code 2017, 2017. Thank you. Susan Newman. Good morning, Susan Newman Scares. I am a homeowner, I'm a mother, grandmother of people that live in Tennessee. I'm also representing the IAEI, and I am fortunate to be serving on my fourth term of the code making panel of the National Electrical Code. I come to you as a citizen of Tennessee begging for you to improve the life of our state. You see, we are living under a code that is almost 10 years old. It's a code mit written at minimum standards. Anything we do to lessen that, we're not doing our citizens right. We're not doing them justly. You see, it takes worldwide communication efforts to put together this code. And it is written, it is stated, to the minimum effect for the safeguarding of not only our property, but our lives. They talk about home fires over 20 years of age, but let's get the statistics. We have firefighters going in new homes. We have home fires that are going on because we do not have current standards enforceable. The one thing the AFCI does is the technology of today. You see, if we maintain what is currently adopted, we're at the 2002 level of arc fault circuit interrupter protection. That is a totally different device than GFCI, ground fault circuit interruption. You see, if we go back to 2002, let's take all of our electronics back there. Let's take our prices for our homes. Let's get rid of our granite countertops and our nice trim in our homes. That's what we're being asked to do. But through the education of these devices, that is how that we can show our citizens we care. If there is nuisance tripping, we're not getting it in statistics. If there is lack of education on how to install properly wiring circuits, we have classes all over the state available to help educate these people because these things should not be happening with a proper education of the electrical industry. And they won't be when we educate ourselves on how they work how they function, and how we install them. So South Dakota exempted that for life safety. We also have exemptions in our Chapter 700 of the code for fire pumps. You see, we rate those way over on a circuit breaker because we don't want anything to happen to those life safety issues. We want those things to go on. We want them to function no matter what is happening around. Same thing goes for AFCI. We want them to function. We want them to trip out when something is incorrect. They're doing their job. That is the technology of today. And that's what we are trying to embrace. I encourage you to care enough about your home, your family, and those around you to fully adopt the minimum standard of the 2017 National Electrical Code. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Feliciano Arigata? Arigata. Thank you. Good morning. Honestly, I didn't even know that I have to talk here, you know. I'm a little bit shy. Um, you don't have to speak. It's just if you want to. Okay. No, no, it's okay. I wanna, I wanna speak because I've been hearing, you know, 
if I am with Simmons, with Iron, with with Square D, I'm going to ask to install a lot of R files, you know. If I am a builder, I'm going to install none of the R files, you know. I'm 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 talking as an electrician, you know. As an electrician, I, w I would say that uh, we need to keep the R files on the bedrooms and on the bedroom lights too. The R fault, the R fault circuit, you know, interrupter, is going to interrupt the. It's not. It's not just the arc. If you have a, even a. A contact between the neutral and the ground. The R fault is going to, trip. Maybe not today. Maybe a week later. Why? Because the. The current. The current goes in. But it goes out, it makes a circle and come back on the neutral. So the R fault is going to is going to trip. So if somebody was asking you know to to leave the R fault just on the plugs. As an electrician, you know, we did we did a couple of service calls that the R fault was tripping on the lights. Why? Because when we installed the incandescent light in the ceiling. The bracket was touching. It was making a contact. The, 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 the bracket was grounded, OK? So the bracket was touching the neutral. So it, and it stripped that, the insulation. But it didn't trip. It takes maybe three or four days to trip, maybe, because you know it makes a circle. Somebody was saying about that. If, if, if i in the bedroom and I move into my house and I in five years, you know, I'm single, and in five years, you know, I'm going to get married, and I go and hang the the picture on my, <laughs> you know, maybe you know, with an L, you can hit the wire, but you know what? On a regular breaker, if you touch just the neutral in the ground, that is not going, never, never is going to trip if it's a regular breaker, but if it's an R fault, it will. So the R fault protect the homes, but please, I'm talking about as an electrician, don't overkill us neither. You know because if you want to install R fault breakers on the entire house, you know what? I'm going to be retired. Why? Because the builders are not going to want to pay all the extra money that is going to cost the implementation, you know, of all those rules. If you keep the R faults on the bedrooms. And the bedroom lights too, and the smoke detectors. I mean, that would be great. But I mean, if you want to, you know, overkill, you know, everything, you know, on us, you know, that would be hard for us too. Another somebody was saying, you know, to eliminate, you know, the circuits in the kitchen. You know, the minimum is two circuits. You know, you can <laughs> be lower than two circuits in the kitchen. You know, you got fridges. Microwaves, disposals, dishwashers, I mean, you know, I mean, what else? Another option, you know, another, not, not an option, another petition that I would like to have would be like a, the difference on the rules. Some local cities, you know, have their own rules. Like Nashville, if they have a separate rules, like different from other counties, like right here, you have to have like a dedicated circuit for the for the smoke detectors, dedicated breaker, R fault breakers. I mean, on the on the on the book, it doesn't say you know you gotta have a dedicated circuit just for the smoke detectors. I mean, if you are going to have something different that is in the book, we would like to have like a pamphlet or like a. If I'm going to come and and pull a permit, you know, I would like to get a. A piece of paper saying that this is the difference between the code and the the local codes. You know. I hope that I'm being clear. It's hard to understand sometimes, but I mean, if you You're didn't, you don't let me know so I can make a complaint with my English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying local jurisdictions have different standards, so you would like for clarification between the state standards and then the local jurisdictions. And the local, standards. yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
That concludes the oral comment portion of this hearing. As of this morning, has the department received any written comments regarding this rulemaking hearing, Director Farley? Uh, yes, we have. Uh, we've received one from the City of Chattanooga Land Development Office. Uh, they are in, their position is they're in favor of the 2017 National Electrical Code adoption without any amendments. Um, received a letter from uh, Nicole Acton. Uh, her mother is a burn survivor, and she is in favor of uh, us adopting the 2017 code without any uh, amendments. And received one from um, a deputy electrical inspector that is in favor of uh, adopting the code without any uh, amendments. And I also received one from uh, Mr. Ron Bethay, and we've, we've heard his statement uh, today on record. Uh, uh, I think I also got one in an email a while ago from uh, an engineer in, and it's concerning the marina um, uh, it, adoption. The department will continue to accept written comments for two weeks. We must receive those comments before or postmarked by September 25th, 2017, which is two weeks from today. The record will close on the 25th, and the department will no longer take comments or meetings on this proposed rule after that time. At the conclusion of the open comment period, the rules will be prepared by the department's legal counsel and routed to the commissioner for approval and signature. Subsequently, the rules will be forwarded to the attorney general's office for review. After approval by the attorney general, the rules will be submitted to the governor's office for review. If approved, the rules will be filed with the Secretary of State, who is responsible for publishing the adopted rules, and then to the Government Operations Committee of the General Assembly for additional review. The rules will become effective 90 days after being filed with the Secretary of State's office. As you can see, there's a process before filing with the State Secretary of State's office, and it's difficult for me to say exactly when that will happen. We will move as quickly as we can. The rulemaking hearing is now concluded. Thank you for your time. Thank you all for coming.